which is really behavior born out of belief. What do you believe about God? And what you believe about God will dictate the way that you pray. We also said there's nothing more that God loves than keeping his promises, answering prayers, performing miracles, and fulfilling dreams. And God, he wants that not only corporately, but personally in your life. He wants to make a difference. We've been studying the story of Honi, the Jewish sage that's described in the Circle Maker book. He was a a man that circled himself, uh, or or really drew a circle around him and and prayed for rain and said, God, I'm not going to move from this circle till it rains. And sometimes when we do things like that, when God calls us to do something, to take a step of faith, sometimes that faith looks like foolishness. Have you ever been there before? And I even put that on the screen there this morning. Faith is the willingness to look foolish. And you're saying, really? Well, I want you to go back a couple weeks if you weren't here and uh, get online and listen to the message when we talked about faith looking like foolishness. Because it's not only one time in Scripture. It's not just Honey, the first century before Jesus lived. Over and over throughout Scripture, we see men and women that were called to do great things. But in the time when they tend to take a step of faith, it often looked like foolishness. We also said last week that we are called to pray hard. But praying hard is two-dimensional. It's praying like it depends on God, number one, but also working like it depends on us. Praying hard. And we pray hard when we become weary. Last week, we ended the service with our hands raised high like this. And I don't know if you remember that. And uh, some of you were, were there at the altars for a long time holding each other's arms up. Uh, I know uh, many were saying, man, my arms were sore after service all afternoon. I'm like, what in the world? But you know what? That, that we kind of had this revelation after service that that's where we want to start is holding each other up. But then we don't just put our arms down and go back to life as normal. We need to walk with each other and help each other along the way. So I'm going to ask you to do something this morning. I'm going to ask that you stand up right where you are, all right? And I want you to lift your hands up here for a moment, all right? And uh, just uh, nice and high, nice and high, all right? And just keep them there for a moment. Now, I'm going to be talking here for a moment, all right? And uh, and then we're going to get to a place where we're going to pray, all right? And I want us to be kind of ready for that. Today, we're going to talk about the key to dreaming big and praying hard is thinking long. Thinking long. And if we don't learn to think long, we will experience a high degree of discouragement in our lives. If we don't think long term, we're also going to see today that prayers do not die and that prayer is an inheritance that we receive and the legacy that we can leave. Dreaming big, praying hard, thinking long is the price we pay for the impossible. Now, I want you to close your eyes with me for a moment. And I want you to imagine a church auditorium much larger than this, packed from front to back, shoulder to shoulder, with people's arms raised high to the Lord. I believe that God is calling us to that. I want you to see that in your mind, that God will be filling not only this place where we are, but even beyond that, our future, that God has plans for us. And though it may seem impossible this morning, God is bringing us to that point. He wants us to be taking steps of faith in that measure. This morning, God wants us to pray hard, to dream big, and think long. Let me pray. Keep your hands high here for another moment. Lord, I pray for each and every person here. God, that you would speak to us by your Holy Spirit. God, I pray that I can get out of the way, and Lord, that you would be used, God, that you'd use my words to in, just impart goodness and greatness into each and every one that's here. God, help us not to be satisfied with where we've been or where we think we might be going, but Lord, let us rely on you, trust in you. God, give us great faith. Help us to walk out your plans for our lives. And Lord, I pray for this body that we would not only begin to see it in our mind, but we'd see it, Lord, even over the next few weeks, God, that you would help us to grow. God, that we would be filling this place multiple times. Lord, that you would call us, and Lord, that we would see hundreds and hundreds of people 
surrendering their lives, being discipled and growing in you. God, I see it in my mind. Lord, I pray that we would see it together for your glory, for your honor. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. How are your hands feeling? Shake them out a little bit, all right? You want me to preach the whole time with your hands up or you want to sit down? I see that sitting down. All right, go ahead. <laughs> People are like, nope, I'm going to sit. That's good. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We're just a couple weeks away from Easter, an exciting time for the church. And, um, just want to encourage you to be inviting people. I want to encourage you to come out this Saturday, be a part of our outreach. It's going to be a blast. You can sign up so we know um, how to prepare for that. Let me ask you this. Can I, do you ever think things in your mind that you think them, and you are so glad that no one else knows what you're thinking? <laughs> It can be good things, you know, you could think things, you know, about yourself. I was, I was thinking, you know, there's times I think, man, you know, I'm, I'm such a better basketball player than that person. Or, you know, I'm such whatever, you know, I, I could lead the country better than Obama or something. You know, I think, that, you know, but I, I'm certainly glad no one hears me say things like that, right? Have you ever been there? Or on the negative side, you're like, man, that is one ugly mug right there. Oh, no, 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 Pete, that's not you. And then you're saying, I'm glad that didn't come out, but it just did. No, sorry. But I don't believe that. I like your hair the way it's up like that, too. Yeah. <laughs> but you think things, and you're glad no one hears, right? Well, can we be honest? That's, there's times we will think things about our Heavenly Father, about God, that you may not want to acknowledge. Like, man, where did that thought come from? Things like, does God really exist? When you think about creation and you look at you know, creation, you're like, certainly there's a creator, but, but then you're in science class and you're like, okay, what, how do I measure this? Or when you think about miracles described in the Bible, the, the blind receiving the sight or the dead raising from the dead, it's like, what in the world? Have you ever been a skeptic, at least in your mind? Am I the only one? I hope not. <laughs> I, I'm sure not. Have you ever wondered, does God hear you when you pray? Maybe you prayed and prayed and prayed, and all it feels like is you're hitting a wall, hitting a wall, hitting a wall. You wonder sometimes, does God care about your circumstances? You're praying for answers, even specific things, and all you hear is a silence, and it's deafening. And you're saying, what in the world is up? God, what are you doing? You circle the cancer in prayer. You circle and you pray. And then the person dies. You circle a miracle and you circle it and you pray and there's no change in the circumstances. You circle your kids that are far away from the Lord, that are, are out there. And you're saying, God, I, I'm circling them until they come back to you and they're still living in sin. Have you been there before? We circle our relationships and we pray and we still struggle with forgiveness or bitterness. And what do you do? Am I the only one that feels like a failure sometimes in our prayers? We say, God, we pray. And, we, and then all of a sudden these questions start to seep in about God. Well, when that happens, the only thing I know to do is to turn to God's word. What does God's word say? God, God's word describes Satan or our enemy as an accuser of the brethren. That means he hates your guts. And the accuser, he would love to make you feel like a failure. He would love for you to give up, to throw in the prayer towel, to, to think you're a failure and to, to fail. But the only way that you fail when you pray is if you stop praying. And so I just want to encourage you this morning that we are here, even this morning, to say we are not going to stop. No matter what kind of fear we might struggle with. You know, there's times I will really struggle. Lord, God, is this church ever going to grow like I see it in my mind? Or will my kids serve God all the days of their lives? And what I have to remember is I have circled those things and I will continue to circle those things in prayer, trusting God to do the impossible. Sometimes I struggle with doubt, saying, God, you know, will the blessings in my life dry up? God has been so faithful, and I can look back and say, holy smokes, look at what God has done. But then I think about the future, and there are times I will doubt, will I really be who I think God is calling me to be? And I remember, 
God's word speaks promises over my life, and I circle those, and I must continue to pray around those. Sometimes I even struggle with faith. I don't know about you. Um, faith is one of my spiritual goals, believing for, for things that I can't see. And I, I can step out in faith in a lot of areas of my life. And then there's other areas I think, man, you know, I pray for a miracle and I see God move and I say, is that going to be the last miracle? Or how is God going to provide in the future? I don't know. But God, how am I going to step out? Or, and it's interesting, as I get older, I measure risk a little different. I don't know if you've noticed that, uh, those of you that are getting older, only some of us, I know that's the case. But no matter what, we are called to walk a walk of faith with our Heavenly Father. We are called to be circle makers, to be prayer warriors. And as we pray, as we seek the Lord, I believe that God answers every single prayer. And He keeps every single prayer promise. We may not know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. Amen? And it's in that light that we would think, okay, all right, we are not just talking about today or this week or this month or even this year. We are people that need to think long with confidence, trusting God beyond today and beyond what we see today in our lives. I want you to turn with me to Joshua chapter 14. There's a story. Um, we've been kind of tracking the children of Israel throughout this series. We looked at Moses and the plagues, Moses in the desert, and um, he calls out and says, yay, we're going to have meat for a thousand, or for not a thousand, for a million people. And we saw the, the miracle of the quail uh, and just a, an incredible miracle. We also looked at the story of Joshua circling the walls of Jericho, praying and then calling out, crying out, not with blades and, and bows and swords, but with, our, with their voices crying out to God. And, and the walls came tumbling down. And there's another player, um, a person, Caleb, in this, in this whole saga of events that is thinking long term. And I want to look at the story of Caleb for a moment. Caleb, at this moment, at Joshua chapter 14, it was uh, about 85 years old. He was an old friend of Joshua, an old guy, if you could imagine, kind of a gray hair. Anybody over 80 years old here today? I don't think so. All right, so, so I can kind of make, oh, are you saying your dad's old? He's kind of saying, hey, look at that gray hair. Yeah. All right, let's go white hair, all right? So I want you to imagine uh, Caleb, 85 years old, probably hunched over, kind of with a cane, white hair, no teeth, just trusting the Lord, just getting by. He could retell the stories of the plague and the quail and Jericho. He was there when Moses came off the, the mountain with the Ten Commandments. Caleb make it, made a name for himself early on in Numbers 13.30, where he came back and reported to the children of Israel, hey, we should possess the land. Let's go up and take possession of the promised land. Joshua, of course, was with him. Joshua and Caleb were the two spies that came back and with a good report, but they lost the debate that day. But God, along this whole path, never forgot Caleb's bold spirit. He followed God wholeheartedly. If you're taking notes this morning, I want you to write that word wholeheartedly because seven or eight times in Scripture we see Caleb described as wholeheartedly giving his heart to the Lord. Caleb was one tracked mind for God. He was in it for the long haul. There was no wavering, no compromise, no negotiating with God's plan. Nothing timid about Caleb, nothing lukewarm, and Caleb never forgot the goal. The goal was the promised land, and it had been promised to Moses and was transferred to Joshua, which we're going to see here in a minute, and then it was the promise was for Caleb, and let's look at Joshua chapter 14. The children of Israel had kind of crossed, they had the, the Jericho, they, they had won at Gilgal, they had done, done all these things, now they had possessed the promised land, and listen to what Caleb uh, talks about. It says, Now the men of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb said to Joshua, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God at Kadesh Barnea, about you and me. 
I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. And I brought back a report according to my convictions, but my brothers who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt with fear. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. There's the first time we'll see that, and it's throughout Scripture that you can see this. So on that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have, have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever. Why? Because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Number two, verse 10, now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years. And just imagine this old guy saying, oh, for 45 years, I've trusted the Lord in the desert, whatever the case. While in the desert, moved back and forth. But you know what's interesting? You might think that, 85 years old. George, how old are you, brother? 76. 76, just a young man, just a young man. And George, I'm just making fun of Caleb here. But you know what's interesting? Caleb reminds me of someone like you. You're close, probably the closest here to, to 80. Five. But listen, he says, look, so I am here today, 85 years old. In verse 11, he says, I am still strong today, as strong today as I was in when Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me on that day. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified. But the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he said. Then Joshua blessed Caleb and gave him Hebron as an inheritance. So Hebron belonged to Caleb ever since. Why? Verse 14 here at the end, because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, wholeheartedly. What's incredible about this story is that Caleb never wavered. He was laser-focused. In Hebron was a city about 3,000 feet above sea level. The Anakites were a fierce, strong giant of a people. It was the hill country, hard to capture. But Caleb was on a mission, a mission to finish what God had started 45 years earlier. A promise that was given to Caleb 45 years previous. Now, 45 years is a long time. That's over half a lifespan for most people. 45 years. And how many know in 45 years that calls for a lot of waiting? A lot of waiting. Waiting like David called out, if you turn with me to Psalm chapter 130, David cries out, I waited for the Lord. My soul waits. In his word, I put my hope. What I love about that is that uh, David is not waiting with some hope that just comes from man, but he's hoping in God's word, what God's word says about him. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchmen wait for the morning. More than the watchmen wait for the morning. I'm not sure why it repeats that, but I did read it like it said. Again, in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 18, we find out that, that you are blessed, all who wait on God. If you wait on the Lord, and for Caleb, I can just imagine year after year after year after year. I will be 37 this year, and that's a long time. But 45 is even longer. Was that, was that hard to wait? Was it possible for him to lose heart or to lose the promise? Absolutely. But did Caleb? No, he hung on to all that God had for him, the promises of God. He would have echoed what Paul said in the New Testament, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me in Philippians 4.13. And we see that heart. It's not a, I can do it because I'm so great. It's a humble uh, but confident, I, I can do it with God's help. Chapter 14, verse 12 of Joshua. And he says, you know what? If God promised it, I can take it to the bank. 
so to speak. And I want to talk about these promises. What did Caleb believe? He believed in the promise from God for the children of Israel. And there was all kinds of circumstances that would have caused him not to believe or to waver or to to give up. But that promise held on. And what's interesting is that as you study that promise, it was first given to Moses, then transferred to Joshua in Joshua chapter 1, and then transferred to Joshua, I mean to Caleb in Joshua 14. He's saying, I'm going to claim what Moses said I could have. The reason I say that is because those promises were transferable. And when we look at Scripture, conservatively, there are 3,000 or more uh, promises in God's Word. Rick Warren did a study and studied that there was over 7,000 promises in Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. So somewhere between three and 7,000 promises. And what's interesting about those promises is that all of those promises have been transferred to us because of what Christ has done on the cross. Yeah. Those promises are for you and are for me. And I understand the need to interpret and apply those in an accurate, historical, and exegetical fashion. But there are moments when you read through Scripture, which I've been encouraging you to do, and the Holy Spirit quickens in our soul, in our spirit, and transfers a promise that was originally for someone else. Maybe you're reading in the Psalms and you read a promise of David and you say, God, God, I'm circling that promise for my life. Or a promise from Paul or Joan or Ruth or Esther. The stories can go on and on. And we, yes, we have to be careful. We don't want to, it's not like the Bible is a promise jackpot and we just call it and it just is. But I believe that most of us, and I would even put myself included, do not claim enough promises from God's word. His promises are yes and amen for us. We can take them to the bank. Those promises need to be circled in prayer. When God illuminates through His Holy Spirit and we circle in Scripture, like I've been encouraging you to do, you circle a promise that your kids are going to be raised up and they're going to serve the Lord. You circle that and you stand on that truth. You pray. You pray over those promises. And our prayers never die. We'll see that in just a minute. But what else is interesting about prayer is that prayer is an inheritance that we receive and a legacy we leave. I want to explain that for a moment, talking about my life. My family, we are fourth generation Christian. My kids will be fifth generation Christians. They are because they've both given their hearts to the Lord. My great-grandma Miller was born and raised in a, in a uh, non-Christian home. Her and her husband, gave, which I had never met my great-great-grandpa, they gave their hearts to the Lord, and they were kicked out of their family. From that moment forward, they, did, they didn't get one Christmas gift, no Christmas cards, no birthday gifts. They were banished from their family. It was hard. But you know what's interesting? Not only was my, my great-grandma Miller saved, but she was filled with the Spirit. And there are stories. I met her when I was young, and I remember going to her funeral saying, this doesn't seem like a funeral. It was more like a celebration. And maybe you've been to something like that. But my grandma, she would, she would speak in tongues <laughs> while she was sleeping. She, would be, she was a prayer warrior. And I believe those prayers have gone forward in generations and have blessed me. My grandma Vey and my grandma uh, Mary and Zoltan, and so, some of you have met them. They, they visit here about once a year. They pray for me and my kids and my wife every single day. Every time I talk with them, they say, hey, we've been praying for you. How are things going at the church? How's Jessica feeling? How how are the kids? How can we be praying for you? And I'm telling you, those prayers are fast forwarded and I am blessed because of it. My parents, same way, they pray for us. I get texts from my mom on Sunday mornings. I've shared that before. And those prayers are, the result of all those prayers is that you're looking at a blessed man. I am blessed because of my parents, because my grandparents and my great-grandparents. Every blessing traces back to a web of prayers. You know, I know what some of you are saying, man, I don't have that kind of inheritance that kind of prayer legacy. But let me just say, 
you can start one today. I was inspired by a story in this book, Praying Circles Around Your Children, by Mark Batterson. is one of the resources. I know a few of you have picked it up. It's interesting that there's a story in here about Susanna Wesley. Anybody heard of Susanna Wesley? All right. She gave birth to 19 children, woo, including two, John and Charles Wesley, the founders of the Methodist movement, which really was a move of God, unprecedented up until that point of history. It, says, it goes on, it says, There is no finding a quiet place to pray when you live in a small house with that many kids. But that reality didn't stop Susanna from praying. She would sit in a rocking chair in the middle of the living room, put a blanket over herself, and intercede for her children. Our excuses just went away, Mark Batterson says, didn't they? <laughs> There's no excuse. You think you got it hard. You know, even the Hardy family, they got like eight kids, you know? I mean, I think that's probably the most that we got around here. But it says your children need to see you and hear you praying. It doesn't matter whether it's in a prayer closet or a prayer chair. You can turn your commute or your workout into prayer times. When you make their beds or fold their clothes, pray for them. Go into their bedrooms while they're sleeping. Kneel at their beds and pray for them. You don't become a praying parent by default. I'm talking to the parents here or future parents. You do it by design, by desire, by discipline. And you can start it today. Prayer disciplines take sheer determination. But if you're determined to circle your children in prayer, you will shape their destiny. Just like Susanna Wesley shaped the destiny of her children, your prayers will live on in their lives long after you die. Guys, we are called to pray. Pray for our families. Your prayers for your children are the greatest legacy you will leave, period. And you know what? I want you to begin to see or continue to see yourself as a prophet in your home. Because as you pray over your kids, and I don't care if even if your kids are grown, as you pray for your kids and you speak into their lives, you speak prophetic words that are shaping and molding your kids. I treasure my Monday through Friday mornings. Those 10 minutes before Logan gets on the bus, Jessica's already to work, Reagan's already off to school, we make it a priority to sit down, to read a little scripture, and to pray. I'm investing into my son. Jessica does the same thing with Reagan earlier. Ra Jessica gets up extra early so she can have time, just her and Reagan. They sit at the table every single morning. And Jessica's investing into our daughter. And sometimes we swap. And she, we can't do it anymore, but we used to swap. But you know what? God, he honors those times. And what's interesting is that we can send those prayers forward. Our prayer can be a legacy. We can inherit them and we can move them forward. The second thing I want you to know is that prayers never die. Say that with me. Prayers never die. They never die. And when I think about that, and I think about the Gateway Church and the prayer legacy that we have received, the heritage of prayer that we have received. I did a little digging this week, and I understand that, that way back, before even the Gateway Church in 2001 was established by Jeff Grinnell, that, that, uh, that there was a church in Grand Haven where there was roots and resources given to the Gateway Church they go back all the way to Leo Tomko, back on 6th and Franklin in Grand Haven, that wanted to reach the youth of Grand Haven and started praying for the youth. And I believe those prayers have fast forwarded. The next pastor was Jack Carrier and then Kirk McLean, 19 years. He moved that church from 6th and Franklin over to Beech Tree and Robbins, and they built the church there. I got the privilege of speaking with him, and I know it's Mandy, that's your grandpa, and it was, thanks for connecting me this week. I was able to talk with him because they had Grand Haven Assembly, which we were able to inherit that building and the resources there. But I understand that we inherited more than just a building. We inherited the prayers of pastor after pastor and after member after member. And what's interesting is some of you were a part of that move 
of God. I talked with Kurt McLean, Pastor McLean, and he's saying, look, the church really grew. There was an outpouring on the lakeshore like they had never seen. People were being healed. And he said, this is a direct quote, he said, I'd never seen a move of God before it or after that period of time in Grand Haven. And I started to share with him my heart to see God move in a powerful way. And he said, he said Ben, we've got to believe together for God to do it again. God wants to move, and he wants to be changing us and challenging us to grow. What's interesting, what he said, because I asked him, I said, what was different then? He said, I don't know. He said, it was the favor of God. But then he said this. He said, he said Ben, I just remember fasting and praying a whole lot in that time. Fasting and praying. And then Pastor McLean said, there's two things that have to be the focus. Love and faith. He said, love is the motivator for people to connect with God and to connect with each other. But then faith is the enabler. And that's what we're talking about. Believing, having faith for something impossible, something that we don't necessarily see today in the physical. So Leo Tomko was praying, Jack Carrier was praying, Kurt McLean was praying, Jeff Grinnell was praying, there were other pastors in between. And we as a church today are blessed because of their prayers and their sacrifice. Do you understand that? Their prayers have gone forward. And we are experiencing the blessing of that. And so I ask you today, what are we going to leave? in the next 30, 40, 50 years? What kind of legacy will we leave here on the lakeshore? We've been talking corporately every week during this series, praying for a great move of God, stronger than ever on the lakeshore, that revival would sweep this area, and not only this area, but all of Michigan. There's uh, many prophetic words over the, the, the uh, state of Michigan that as Michigan goes, so goes the country spiritually. And as Detroit goes, and, and it's interesting, in a couple of weeks I'll be going with a, with a few of you, and you're more than welcome to come if you're interested, on a Friday and Saturday, a prayer meeting in Rochester just to seek the face of God for our state, trusting God for a move of God, a powerful move of God. We've been, we are believing for the greatest growth that this church has ever seen, and I believe it's right in front of us that we already are moving in that direction. It's right in front of us. And I start to think about the four things that we've been asking you to pray for. Revival, number one. And what that means to me and what it means to us as a leadership team is that we're praying for, for souls to be saved, but not just to be saved and then gone so we can have a bunch of numbers, but people will be saved and discipled, filled with the Holy Spirit, transformed lives is revival in my mind. Revival, we've been praying for property and praying for a razor focus and we're believing that God is, is showing us that way and uh, shortly we're going to be revealing kind of what the direction that God has for us. We've also been praying for our communities. You've been doing it everywhere you drive, everywhere you walk, in your home, in your, in your neighborhoods, in your workplace, around your cubicles, at school for your students. Wherever we go, we're praying for those around us praying for impact. And then we're, the fourth thing we're praying for is our staff because we know when God is moving that the enemy attacks. So we're praying for Pastor Pete and Deb. We're praying for uh, Larry and Bonnie. Uh, we're praying for Rick and Penny Hines. We're praying, uh, you're praying for Jessica and for me and my kids surrounding us in prayer. Not only for us, but we're also praying for our future staff. The Lord has given us a 10-year plan to kind of move towards, and we're believing that there, there'll be continued added staff, and, and we need desperately to hear from the Lord. And I think about that, and I think about our great growth potential as a, as a body, and it excites me. I'm thinking, man, that's the kind of church that I want to be a part of. And I know that's what you want. You want a move of God in your life through a local church, making an impact locally, and across the globe. Amen? That's why we're here. But not only uh, corporately do we want God to be moving, but individually, we are desperately asking God to move in your lives, to, for you to dream and to plan, for you to get a word from the Lord. I've been encouraging you to take a half day or a full day 
even better from now till Easter. And I know some of you have heard that every week and you're saying, oh, I need to plan that. Well, you've got two weeks from today is Easter. Take a, some time off. You say, man, I can't do without the lost wages. I believe in a half day that God could speak to you and give you dreams and vision and, uh, and direction that will far outpass what a paycheck for a half a day could do. Do it. Take the time. Schedule it. Ask for the time off. Lay on your face before the Lord. Lay on your back. Pray. Take you in a prayer journal. Take your Bible. And I'm daring you to dream big, to pray hard, and to think long term. Think long term. The encouragement this morning is for you and for me not to lose heart, not to lose hope, not to lose faith or to give up on love, but to keep on circling. Prayer warriors, pray for the long term. I think about my life and some of the prayer circles that I've circled myself in, saying, God, I know that you've called me to ministry. I went to my first position out of college, and I was there for a couple years, and the Lord started stirring in me again that I would be a lead pastor one day. And it wasn't for five years, five and a half years later, until I came, we moved here as the lead pastors of the Gateway Church. And so it seemed like an eternity in some ways. It's like, man, I circled and circled and circled. And then we've been here six and a half years, and there's some things that we have circled and we're believing God for. It's like, oh, God, will it ever come to pass? And I do believe that it is, and I believe that even quickly in some circumstances. But the question is, how long will I pray? How long am I willing to circle? And the answer has to be, as long as it takes. The Lord had put a thought in my heart, and I've shared this before, that um, the Lord put in my heart to, that at some point in my life, I want to give away a million dollars in a one-year period of time. <laughs> it sounds like a crazy, impossible dream. But I believe as I take steps in that direction, each year being faithful and giving, that I'll get closer and closer to a million dollars given away. And God will, will honor that in my life. And I believe that. You know what's interesting? I believe that the harder the climb, the sweeter the summit is. The harder the climb, the sweeter the summit. I've been on some mountaintops, and the harder it is to get there, you can breathe easy on top and look around and be like, man, this is amazing. And when we become circle makers, I believe that God, He will take us to places we cannot even imagine. And I believe that for you, I believe it for me, I believe it for us corporately. Circle making is hard work and it's a long-term effort. And in that process, we've got to be aware of outside voices of doubt and fear. We need to shout like, like Paul, the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 4.13 that we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. But there was a, something that jumped out of my spirit this week that I want to end on. It's back in Joshua chapter 14. I want you to turn with me there again. I asked you to write down the word wholeheartedly or to circle it in your Bible uh, because over and over in Scripture, we see Caleb described as a person who gave his heart wholeheartedly to God. He gave everything to God, even in his old age of 85 and beyond. And what we see, why did God do that? Over and over, we see in verse 9, I love it, it says, because you have followed the Lord, your God, wholeheartedly. And this morning, I am calling myself and I'm calling you to serve God wholeheartedly with everything that's within you. And if there's anything less, it's not acceptable. We need to think long term. Some of you have been dreaming and you've lost the dream. God wants to revive that. Some of you have been praying for miracles, and it seems like you're hitting walls. But God wants you to break through and to keep on circling till He answers. Because He promises to answer those prayers. God is calling us to be circle makers for our family, for our church body, for our community, for our world. And with that, 
It takes people that are wholeheartedly committed to the Lord. Now, in a minute, I'm going to ask a very difficult question. Are you wholeheartedly committed to the Lord this morning? I'm not asking you if you've given your heart to the Lord in a minute, but are you wholeheartedly, everything, are you sold out for what God has in your life? Now, I'm going to ask that you would respond and really take a good look inside in a minute. But before we do that, before we think, okay, how are we doing? We need to make sure that we're all giving our hearts to the Lord this morning. And if you found yourself here at the Gateway Church and you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, or if you're away from the Lord and if you were to die today, you don't know where you'd spend an eternity, I'm going to challenge you in the next moment to respond by lifting up your hand. In fact, let's bow our heads and close our eyes just for a moment of, of uh, time between you and God. Is there anyone here this morning? We've been praying for you, and you'd say, that's where I am today. I need to surrender my life to Jesus today. Is there anyone here, just by the showing of your hand, just slip up your hand, I'm not going to embarrass you, not going to call you out. Anyone saying, yep, that's where I am. I need to know Jesus as my Savior. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Praise the Lord. There's one young lady that raised her hand. I want to pray for her. Would you pray with me? Lord, we just honor what you're doing in this lady's life. God, we pray that you would just intervene. Lord, that she would surrender to you that she would know you more and more. And God, that she would not only surrender today, but that she would grow in you, making life decisions that would result in a life wholeheartedly committed to you. Lord, we pray it in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for your move. Thank you, Lord. Now with your head bowed and eyes closed, I'm going to ask a bold question. Are you wholeheartedly committed to the Lord and to His plans for your life? If you cannot answer that question with a resounding yes this morning, I'm going to ask that you would just stand right where you are. And there's no shame in this. There's just saying, God, that's, I just want, I want to be wholehearted. If you want to be wholeheartedly committed and you feel like you're struggling in that area, saying, I, maybe I've given you part of my life, but not all of it, I'm just going to ask that you stand right where you are. And I'll just right now, just stand up. Anyone at all? Sure. Yeah, thanks for being honest. You bet. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Just wait another moment. Anyone else want to respond in that way? Say, God, I want to be wholehearted. I don't feel like I am today. Would everyone stand with me across this room? All across this room, everybody standing. This morning, I want to close with a time of prayer for those around us. Last week, we ended with our arms raised. We've already mentioned that this morning. But we, bury, we are bearing each other's burdens. We are lifting each other up. And what I'd like us to do this morning is to pray for the person on our left side and pray for the person on our right side and ask God to move in their lives. And if you don't know the person on your left or the right, or if you're on the end, you've got to pray for the person way over here. Uh, just we'll figure that out. Just that we don't have to move, but you just, we want to spend a few moments in prayer. And then we want to pray, or then we want to spend a moment saying, God, I want to give you everything within me to be wholeheartedly committed to you. So when we walk out of here, that we can have our eyes high, our heads held high, confident that God is moving in our lives and moving here at the Gateway Church. Amen? Amen. Let me pray. Lord, I pray uh, for these next few moments, Lord, that you would challenge us to strengthen each other with our prayers, that we'd slide and we'd pray for one another, putting our hand on their shoulder or, or grabbing their arm or uh, just even just a prayer. Lord, I, I just pray that you would use us as a body to bless one another. I also pray, God, that you would take us 
to another level in you. That we would be like Caleb, wholeheartedly committed to you. Holy Spirit, work in our lives for your glory, for your honor. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.